Well, good morning, RBC. We are so excited to be with you guys this morning. Um, as you know, I'm Joe Barnes, and there's my wife, Laurel, my children, Joseph and Ann. And uh, yeah, we're just so thankful. The first thing I want to say is we're just so thankful for our partnership with you guys. And before I share about Peru, I want to give you one reminder and one encouragement. And the reminder is, is that the mission belongs to the local church. So RBC may not be our sending church, but you're partnered with us in the work in Peru. And something that's really interesting in the book of Acts is when they complete their first work, their first missionary journey, and they go back to Antioch, their sending church, they give a report. But they actually don't only give, they not only give a report to Antioch, they give a report to other churches around Antioch and then on their travels to Jerusalem. So that's what we're here to do, is to encourage you what God's doing in Peru and just encourage you that God's doing this through this partnership as well. Um, I also want to encourage you uh, with something. I want you to know that when we send out our updates, we can actually see, every time we send an update out to a subscriber, we can see how many times that update is opened. And I know Brandon sends that uh, that update out to the church, and RBC blows everybody else out of the water. I mean, you guys open it up like 10 times more than any other church or anyone else. So that communicates to us, wow, they want to know what's going on. They're praying for us, and that that encourages us. So um, I know there's a lot of new members here at RBC. Um, I think, raise your hand if you met John when he was here. Okay, so everybody, okay most of everybody knows who John is. Yeah, so what I want to do in this time is catch some of you up to where we are, uh, where we are in our, our journey in Peru, and then I want to talk about the actual work itself and the, the church plant um, that's, in, that's going on in Puno right now. So John and I are both pastoring a church in Puno, Peru, and we started this church together with our families. But it's interesting how John or how God brought John and I together. I went on a short-term mission trip, and John was actually living in the United States, but he flew into Peru, and we met in Peru while I was on this mission trip. And he, as an unbeliever, was translating the gospel for me. And so after this trip, he was convicted. We found out he was living in Arizona, a really hard situation. The church wanted to, to help him, and so some brothers offered him work. Another brother, brother offered him a place to stay. And so through that relationship... Um, John came to Christ. And then as I was wrestling with a call to ministry and missions, God eventually called John to go back to Peru. And he said, why not go with me to Peru? Why, why go to the Middle East? Man, this, this just makes so much sense. And the church agreed. It just seemed like that was God's will and his providence. And so the church sends us to Peru. We started out in Peru in a place called Cajamarca. We had no clue where we were going to work. We actually went not to confuse you, we're not Presbyterians, but sometimes people get confused when I say this, but we first started working with some Presbyterian churches, some sweet brothers in Peru, in the north part of Peru, and we, we helped them just doing evangelism and, uh, and just encouraging their members as we learned the language, as we learned the culture. And so after a couple of years with them, we decided to move to Puno and live in Puno, but try to plant a church in another city called Juliaca, about 40 minutes drive away. And Juliaca is extremely dangerous. It's an extremely hard city to live in. We just thought it'd be better for our families to live in Puno. And then we traveled to Juliaca. So we were trying to plant a church with a group that was already there. And then 2020 happened. And no, there was no transportation between Juliaca and Puno. And as many of you know, we were stuck in the United States. The border was closed. There was no way to get back to Peru. And so John, he was unable to travel back uh, back and forth between Juliaca and Puno. And two guys came to him in Puno and they said, hey, our churches are closed. We heard you're a missionary. Can, can we study the Bible with you? Will you teach us the Bible? And he was like, okay, I will, but just don't say anything. So that's a... Uh, it's just another level of, I guess, tyranny, you could put it that way, in Peru. The consequences are much greater 
um, when you rebel against the law there, especially during that time. And so that little Bible study grew a little more and a little more. And then as things began to open up, a lot of churches just wouldn't open. And they had the freedom. The government wasn't restricting them, but they would just wouldn't open. And so people just started coming to this Bible study because they were hungry for God's Word. And so from that Bible study, even though that whole group was not the, the initial group of the church or the, the charter members of the church, that's how the Bible, or this Bible study is how the church in Puno started. I think that's just a good reminder that we labor for the Lord, but if He doesn't build the house, we labor in vain, right? And so we're trying to plant this church in Huliak. I've given all these efforts. That's where the most need is. we got to be there. And God says, no, not in your strength, in mine. And he uses what shut most churches down in Peru to start a new one. And so that's where we are, is we're in this two-year-old church plant. Last month, we celebrated two years. And the goal now is, yes, to help the church continue growing um, in their love for one another, grow in their understanding of the Word, and their love for Christ, grow as families, and all those things. But we have a real heavy focus on trying to raise up other elders. Because that's what Paul did. He uh, appointed elders after he planted these churches so that um, he could go on and plant more churches in the future. So that, that's our goal right now. The issue, I think many of you know this, is John and Rachel have some health issues. And that brings into question, well, how long will we be in Puno? What's going to happen with the church? Who's going to lead the church if we have to leave? And those are all questions that I can't even answer right now. And we'll keep you updated. But pray for us in that, that God would provide a man and that God would provide a plurality of men. He would provide a plurality of, of men to, uh, to shepherd that church. Um, and then just pray for wisdom because there's some big decisions that will have to be made as far as will both of us go? Will I stay? How long would I stay? Will John try to start a new work? And then our sending church is pretty heavily involved in that decision-making process. But we just need a lot of wisdom from the Lord. And you can pray healing for, for Rachel and John. That God would just take their, their infirmities away. But that may be God's, God's plan. Um, I'm trying to think of any other. Oh, I, one, th one other thing I think I'd like to do is encourage you with some ways in which God's been working in the lives of the people in the church. We don't do anything special. We're very similar to uh, RBC. We lean on the means of grace. We really want our people to embrace the one another's in Scripture. We really want people to embrace a culture of hospitality um, to where everybody's not dependent on the pastor but dependent upon the whole congregation for, uh, the, for their spiritual life. Um, and so we really push hard on those things in the church. And little by little, the church is kind of opening themselves up to those things. The Andean culture, especially the, the people group, the Iamidan people group that's in our area, are very closed, hard people. And they won't enter into a deep relationship with you or even other, others in their community unless there is just an extreme amount of confidence between two people. And so the church is growing in that, but that's a big a big hurdle to jump there. Um, we've also just seen God's preached word work in the church. Several members in the church weren't saved through evangelism methods. I mean, we go out and preach the gospel, but I hadn't seen anybody saved through evangelism in the streets. But many people have come to Christ just by sitting under the preached word week in, week out. And then over time, they can actually say, hey, I understand this gospel now. There's several people who when we say, hey, what's the gospel? How can you make it to heaven? How, how is somebody made right before God? And they're just not clear on it at all. And then maybe two or three months later, they can kind of kind of explain this back to me. And then a little later, they can actually make the gospel clear and say, I don't know exactly when I trusted Christ, but I just know I trust Him. And we've seen that several times just through the preaching of the Word. And we've also seen just God bring about conviction um, um, and, and many people over their, over their sin, um, just major changes that they need to make in their life. For example, there was one lady who was a director of a Christian kindergarten and she was, I think, making decent money and this was the main source of income for her family. But her husband's fully capable to lead their, their family 
He's a, a baker, very good at his trade. And their dream was to open a bakery. I mean, bakeries are huge there. And I mean, everything I've eaten from him is very good. He's good at what he does. But to start a business, there's a huge risk involved. And that was what they were scared to do, was for him to fulfill the mission God had called him and being a baker in Puno and lean upon this security that they had through her and, and her occupation. And just through preaching through Genesis and teaching through Bible study, she and her husband started talking more, began to talk with John and I and say, we, we realize that we're, we're not trusting God and, and I need to lead my family in this area. Her, her, her need to work right now is not absolutely necessary. We're just not walking in faith. And um, they start this bread business. They start this bread business. And then, as most of you have heard, there were some rioting going on and political unrest. A week later, all this starts. And they're like, oh, no, we just rented this oven. We just took out this loan. We're about to crash and burn. But the issue is, is now food trucks can't get into the city. The streets are shut down and people got to eat. So the only thing that was providing food for a moment in their little neighborhood was the bakery. And their business actually was more successful than it, than it would have been without, uh, um, uh, yeah, without the, the riots and all that. Sorry, lost my train of thought there. But, but the thing is, you know, God doesn't have to bless us in those ways. He doesn't have to be merciful there. But he, he just blessed their obedience there in a really unique way. So I can tell you lots of stories like those where just through the means of grace, just through the preached word and exalting Christ among his people, um, God's working in the hearts of his people there. So um, that's just to give you a little glimpse into that. But primarily pray for uh, the leadership issue. We really need another man to come alongside us and lead with John and I. Um, so that we can leave the church um, with a pastor, and then so that we can take care of the Chavez health. Um, that's a that's a important thing as well. Um, there's a man named Ray, and when I say Ray, I don't mean R A Y like we use the name Ray, but it's Ray, and that means King, and his name is actually King David. So King David is in our church, everybody, uh, and um, we joke because he's his uh, he's from Incan descent. Possibly. He speaks this language called Quechua, so we say he's, he's, he's our king. He's come from the Incans. And any, anyway, it's, it's, to me, seems clear that God's called this man to ministry. He's a very mature Christian. He's been with us since Juliaca. He actually lives in Juliaca and travels every week. He's the first person to church every Sunday morning. Sometimes he's there before John and I. He's a faithful brother, um, truly cares for the souls of the congregation, has not asked to be a pastor, doesn't ask to teach, but he goes after the sheep and seeks to, to take care of them and, and, and to care for them. And so we've been given him opportunity to teach, and he teaches well. He's teaching our, uh, the catechism on Sunday mornings for about eight to ten minutes, and we walk through the, basically the Baptist catechism because a lot of the, the doctrinal ideas, the people have just never heard. And so week after week, they go, wow, Ray is really helping us because I never heard about that idea before. Or I've heard of that, but I didn't understand what that was. And he's just able to explain those things in a simple way, introduce new, important concepts of the Christian faith to our people. So pray for him that God would call him. He, he's more than willing to use his gift of teaching to the church. He just says, I don't know if I'm called. He says, I'm wrestling with being called to the ministry. I, I just don't know if I am, but I'm willing to use my gifts to build up the church. Um, and of course, the man that enters into the office of elder, he has to aspire that office. He has to desire it. So just pray that God will put it in his heart. Just give him a strong desire. Um, so anything else you'd like me to touch on? I didn't hit. So to pull that together, I really want us to pray for Joe and then mentioned the Chavez family, whom was with us uh, several months ago, um, that you'll remember because John preached through Psalm 1 in our service. So if due to John and Rachel's health, they end up having to move, and that's what it looks like, 
Uh, their sending church is just outside of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and they are really wanting to send people out together. They've had bad experiences with just sending out one family to plant a church. And so uh, they, if they do have to do that, they don't want to just leave a church in its infancy, especially uh, without pastors and without shepherds. There's no other healthy churches anywhere in the remote area. Uh, so they would be swallowed up very quickly with false teaching and no telling what else. So they're just really in a period, the, uh, the Barnes family and the Chavez family, of praying how the Lord would uh, move in this. Uh, we actually met uh, this week with a missionary society trying to get some wisdom and think through that. Uh, so we're not their sending church, but we are like family to them and we're a secondary church of support. Um, I, I, we probably talk every single day, it feels like, just bouncing things back and forth. And God's really awesome. working uh, with them. One other thing I'd like for you to talk about, Joe, another aspect of the ministry is, um, is the extension of what God's doing now through the church. So first of all, they're laboring in Peru, in northern Peru, and God ends up moving them more to the south, to Puno. And so we help them to, uh, to make that move, to move their family across the country. And they're preaching the gospel. They're sharing at universities. I've been to the places where they are. I've seen the work for myself. And, uh, and there's just nothing. They're, they're sharing Christ. They're trying to be faithful. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it seemed like out of nowhere, Joe, God just began to work. And, and uh, someone's converted, so they baptize them. And then someone else is converted, and they baptize them. And then now, uh, here we are, a church of 32, 32. 32 members just in a short period of time. And they are just salivating for the Word of God yeah. and for the work of, of what He's doing. And so it's just really taken off. But I also want to say that what God's doing there is really, really close. If, if, if not on, I mean, extremely close to what we do here in terms of what our services look like on Sunday in terms of our membership processes, in terms of the culture in the church. Uh, so I'm really excited the way that God's moved. Were you gonna add something to that? Yeah, when you said extension, you mean just like the growth? Okay, so outside of the- The nine members, we started with nine members, and now we're at 32. I don't know if that's what you meant. Yeah, so as an extension of what God's doing in planting the church, teaching the word, saving the people, uh, sharing the gospel, now you guys have had a few different opportunities, and one that I'm really excited about is uh, the work that Victor's doing. Sure. sure. Uh, so we talk about that for yeah. a few minutes. Yeah. So there is a ministry called Peru Center for Law and Justice. There is a Presbyterian brother, and, and he's from the northern part of Peru. His name's Victor Ventura. And he's a Christian lawyer. He has his own law office, his own um, practice. And he and some other missionaries from the PCA started this ministry called Peru Center for Law and Justice. And primarily what they do, um, or I guess their, their first goal in mind is we want to help people who find themselves in unjust situations who, who have no representation in a court setting. And so one example might be a single mother who uh, is a good mother, but there's someone else in the family who wants to uh, accuse her of things she didn't do in order to take the children away. And she has no way to defend herself if that person pays the judge off. But with a lawyer, those things just won't, they just won't fly. So they've uh, defended a lot of abused women, um, a lot of women um, who've been in that very situation where the mother-in-law is trying to take the children and things like that. And so in their service to them, they share Christ with them, but they do it in connection to the local church. And they, they want to do that in Puno as well, and they want to partner with us. So the counseling, um, going through meeting, or going through the gospel through three or four meetings is a required thing for each, each individual that they help. If you're not willing to receive the gospel or receive counseling from a pastor, we're, we're not going to help you. Um, so that's where we'll come into play in that. And then there's a lady in our church who actually just passed the bar, and now she part-time works online for Victor's um, um, law office, 
but she is like the extension of this ministry in Puno. And so the hope is, is that um, this ministry could become really active in Puno. Then kind of a secondary goal is to have influence in the political sphere through education. So Victor used to teach in the universities, and what he wants to do is have conferences and invite speakers, even from the states, because that just, if you bring in someone from the United States, people will come just because you're there. And, and, and do these conferences for young law students, the future judges, the future politicians, the future lawyers, and talk about um, just biblical concepts of justice, the kind of uh, reform uh, that's needed in Peru itself. Um, yeah, there's many things like that. And then an opportunity in those, in those types of conferences to preach the gospel to these people as well. 